everyone. We're going to start talking about the Earth's interior, and I want to start off by asking a few people a question. And as I ask them the question, I would like for you to try to come up with your own answer to the same question. So here we go. So question, how do we know about the interior of the Earth? Like if we, if we, uh, if we know certain information about like the mantle and the core, how do we know that information? Any ideas? Um, drilling into the Earth. I'm probably drilling. Drilling in? Yeah. Okay, how about the core? Oh, we, the core? Have, we dri have we drilled all the way to the core? No. But uh, maybe the rocks around it? How do we know about the interior of the Earth? Yep. Uh, drilling down. Um, I guess looking at the rock formation, whatever formations we've been able to get. That's it. People think that we uh, we know about the inside of the earth from drilling, but I'm here to tell you that we really don't know much from drilling. The the mantle, the core, we know about them in a much different way. We have never actually drilled to those. Right here on the left is the deepest is the location of the deepest we have ever drilled, and it was never past the crust, never past the crust. Here, I'll show you a little video clip talking about this. In 2007, a sinkhole formed in Guatemala deep enough to hold two statues of liberty. And the Kimberly Diamond Mine took more than 40 years to make and is the deepest hole ever dug by hand. But are these the biggest and best holes of all time? To find out more, all aboard the boat. Drainage holes like these help evacuate water when it gets dangerously close to the top of a dam or a road. Now normally, they look like this, but when the water level rises, they become giant holes in the earth. When the ground around a drilling rig in Darvaza, Turkmenistan collapsed, geologists lit the earth's leaking gas on fire so it wouldn't spread to villages. They thought it would run out of fuel in a few hours, but today, 40 years later, this fiery hole, now known as the door to hell, continues to burn. But we've been closer to hell. The Kola Superdeep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole mankind has ever drilled. It reaches down 7.6 miles and was abandoned when scientists found that temperatures that far down are nearly twice as hot as expected, almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though this is a very cool uh, thing that they did over in Russia, and we did learn a lot of stuff from it, it still doesn't tell us how we know about the interior of the earth we never made it past the crust so that question again how do we know and it comes down to a simple answer and here is the real answer seismic waves these are the waves produced by earthquakes if you have an earthquake in in one location it'll send all kinds of seismic waves all around the world not just the waves that you know crumble buildings in the local area where the earthquake happened but it'll send it through the earth right through the middle of the earth to the other side of the world and we can read those so let's talk about the types of waves here as you can see here in this little picture the waves that happen on the surface that actually um, crash buildings are called Raleigh waves and love waves and while those are pretty interesting and there's a lot to learn those are not the ones I'm concerned with I'm concerned with these ones the P waves or primary waves and the S waves or secondary waves. So let's talk about these ones. First, we're gonna kind of look at what how they behave, okay? The P waves and the S waves are the ones that move through the inside of the earth, not across the surface. They're not the ones that crash buildings. Um, they move through the inside of the earth. And a P wave called a, a compression wave moves like this. It's like if you took a long slinky and pulled it back and let it go and you get that kind of domino effect. That's pretty important because it tells us what P waves can do. Um, and the, the important part here is, here's the two important parts, they move very fast and they can move through all materials, solid materials, liquid materials, even gas, uh, gaseous materials. And that's going to be important in a minute so keep that in the back of your head. Let's look at the S waves. These are also known as secondary or shear waves. And if you think of a pair of shears, a pair of scissors, you got to open them up and down. That's how a S wave moves. All right? It kind of looks like the wave you see in the ocean. But remember, these are the waves moving through the inside of the earth. 
So here's what they do. Because they are slower, that's why we call them secondary, um, they don't reach a specific location quite as quickly as a P wave. And they can only move through solids. Think of the S in S wave as if it stands for S for solid. It can only move through solid. Very important. So here's a picture of, um, uh, this is the coast of South America. Here's Peru and Bolivia over here. And this is off of Google Earth. All of these little red bubbles represent earthquakes. And I was telling you earlier how the S waves and the P waves move through the inside of the Earth. I just want to kind of demonstrate to you what I mean by this. So there's lots and lots of earthquakes going on, not just, not just in this part of South America, but all over the world. And if there's earthquakes happening here and here and here and here all over the place, they move through the inside of the earth. But they don't just move through um, in a straight line. They will they'll kind of behave weird as they move through, which using that information of how they move weird is what has taught us about the interior of the earth. All right? So... Uh, just to kind of get a point across here, if there's an earthquake going on here, an earthquake going on here, and one going on here, and they're moving through the inside of the earth, how do we know about them on the other side of the earth? How do we read the uh, S waves and P waves that have been moving through the inside of the earth? So in other words, if there's an earthquake happening in, Ch in China, how do we know about it here in the U.S.? And the simple answer is we use one of these things. These, um, this is called a seismometer, and a seismometer when those S and P waves come through, will actually pick up on um, on those those waves. I was saying that the the seismic waves don't move through in a straight line when there's an earthquake, and what actually happens is as the wave moves down through the earth, when it hits a different layer, that different layer is a different layer because it has a different density or different temperature. And that's how we define the layers inside the Earth. And the, the seismic wave will move straight until it hits that different density or that different temperature. And that will cause the, uh, the wave to refract. You guys know refraction of light. You've seen it a lot. Um, this one over here on the right is actually really cool. It's a negative refraction. If you look at it, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It actually bends the straw the opposite direction. Um, so the density will actually change the refraction. I want to show you a video clip that demonstrates that. All right, guys. So I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to take some uh, some of this corn syrup and show you how different density material. You can watch this really thick, very dense material. How it can um, refract this little glass rod. Okay, let me turn this so you guys can see it well. We'll add some more. All the way to the top. If you get a good look at this, I'll move the camera a little closer. You can see the refraction of the straw. Now, I'm going to add some water now. Water is much less dense. You can kind of see, whoa, making a mess. The water is going to sit on top. And I'll hold this kind of up right here. If you look at this, you might be able to tell that the, the less dense water has a different refracting abilities than the more dense corn syrup. So, um, so here we go. Let me do a couple drawings here. Here's what's happening. If we have an earthquake right here in this location, boom, and it comes through, a seismic wave will begin to bend when it hits these different areas. They refract, right? So you get this refraction. And this can happen, you know, if it's all radiating from this one earthquake. Um, and then the little seismometers over here can pick up on it. And when they find out, hey, you know what, the earthquake actually happened right here in location A, and they look at where they are compared to location A, they can calculate this refraction 
And by looking at the, uh, the seismometers, they can figure out how deep, or time-wise, how deep um, those refractions occurred. And they can start to extrapolate, throw a big word at you, what the inside of the Earth looks like. Uh, you know, I say all this, I want you to keep this in mind. This, this is kind of a weird thought. We know less about the inside of the Earth than we probably do about the stars in outer space, which are further away. But as scientists, you know, this is how we figure out what's going on inside the Earth. Right? Here's, here's a better picture of what I was just drawing. We have a, an earthquake at zero degrees up here. Where are we? There we are. And let's assume that there's seismometers at all of these locations where the waves hit. Um, we'll start to see this weird bending occur. Okay, That bending starts to tell us something. You also notice that here, um, there are no seismic waves being reached to seismometers that exist in that area. It's called a shadow zone. Uh, the, the refraction happens enough so that this whole area just won't get all through here, won't get any seismic activity. Now if you change the location of the earthquake, you move it you know, down to, let's see, right around here, then you have to shift, the, shift all of these angles and the shadow zone would happen more like over in this area. Now being that there's so many earthquakes, we can uh, do a little model here. We can start gathering data like, here watch this, let's say there's an earthquake here and we get, there's some waves going, there's some waves going and there's all these other waves being picked up, all these other waves being picked up. You have to forgive my, my unsteady hand. And then there's this whole area of shadow zone over here. Well, when you have another earthquake over here, you're going to get the same effect, only you get it here, you get it here, here's your shadow zone. And if you get another earthquake over here, same effect, you get it here, you get it here, there's your shadow zone. If you get it over here, same effect, you get it here, you get it here. And there's your shadow zone over here. Well, after a while, what you end up doing is you end up outlining a layer of the Earth, the core. And being that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of earthquakes on a um, yearly basis, we can outline the different layers very quickly so we get an idea of what we see. And that is how we know about the inside of the Earth.